All right. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the second edition, uh, part two of Mythbusters here, where myself, Ryan Woodhouse, domestic wine buyer at K&L Wine Merchants, uh, joins Kai Stromer, my counterpart down in Southern California, and we hope to dispel some of those ongoing myths uh, about domestic wines. Last time we took on uh, the, the myth of oaky, buttery, stereotypical California Chardonnay and uh, did a whole lineup of, of racy, high acid, super fun California Shards. And today we are taking on the idea that all domestic cab California Cab predominantly, I think we're featuring all California Cab today, are big, rich, ripe, oaky, over-the-top uh, fruit bombs. So we've got a little lineup here. Kai and myself have picked out a couple of our favorites, uh, some kind of modern, edgy wines, some old classics, and we are attempting to look at more classical, balanced, reserve styles of domestic cab. I see Kai has just uh, signed in here. Let's... Hello, Kai, are you with us? Here he is. How you doing, Kai? Good, good. How are you doing? Excellent. Good. Good to see you. I just you gave, a, I gave a very brief uh, intro. Um, I don't know if you have anything to add of what we're hoping to achieve today, or we'll just dive straight in. I say we drive st dive straight in because I didn't hear it, and my elevation's okay. way off. So I'm adjusting here. <laughs> But I know whatever you said is exactly what we agreed to. So there you go. You've got to you got to you got to get the right you got to get your right angle there, Kai. There you go. That's that, that's look handsome. That's that's your angle right there, looking good. <laughs> well, that might be a little close. Okay. Um, I I was just saying, part two, MythBusters, looking at some of these persistent stereotypes about domestic wine, and we are going to run through some cabs today to hopefully show folks um a, a delicious range of domestic cabinets out there. Right on. Cool. You want to you wanna go? I've been talking for a bit, so you go. No, well, wine I'm number super, one. I'm super excited because I definitely cut my teeth in the wine business drinking California Cabernet. The first store that I worked out was shopping Glendale. The, it was all about Cabernet there. So all my wine trips early on, the early 2000s, was Napa, Napa, Napa. So for me, it feels really good to be back sort of like to the, the homeland where it all began for me. So uh I love Cabernet. I love kind of all styles of Cabernet, but I definitely have been in the business long enough to have seen the trend that went from, well, what we would consider normal Cabernets, and then they got sort of like Cabernet on steroids, and they got really like juiced up and amped up. And, you know, there was that Robert Parker train, which, to be fair, Robert Parker did an amazing amount of credit for, you know, Napa Valley Cabernet, and it was mostly good. But um, today we'll look at a few producers who never got on that train, right? Exactly. Yeah. And a few producers that came along after that train had uh, left the station. So, so I'm going to start off with something, a, a little number that we've had a fair amount of success with so far. It is the uh, 2017, the producer's name, this is one people may not know, is called Silenus, which is the, uh, the Greek god who was the, uh, the teacher to Dionysus. So the guy knew some shit. Here's the label. It's got a little <laughs> picture of Dionysus on it. Uh, this bottling is called Tyros, and Tyros means apprentice. So Dionysus was the apprentice to Silenus. So there's our Greek history out of the way. Um, okay. This is a property that goes back a long time. With, uh, they've been primarily grape growers. Um, they've sold to Silver Oak. They used to sell to Robert Mondavi, Claude Duval, a uh, handful of others. Um, what's important about them since they've started to become bottlers as well is that they are located, and why they fit into our discussion, is they're located in the Oak Knoll District. So we're further south in Napa. We are um, in a, a cooler environment. So we're south of Yontville, north of San Pablo Bay, but you have those uh, sort of mitigating San Pablo climate situation happening that kind of cools down the vineyards and you wind up with wines that are a little bit more, I think, elegant, uh, restrained. Uh, I don't want to say the word austere. I just would say that they're, they're proper. So for today's event, I broke out the, the Riedel Sommelier series, Cabernet <laughs> glass. You could wash nice. a small what a pro. in one of these things. What, what a pro. Or what? What a pro. <laughs> yes, thank you. <laughs> I, I think I bought these back in 
1986 or seven. So they've been around, but somehow they've survived all this time. Wow, yeah, that's impressive. Anyway, uh, and they've gone and they've traveled over the Atlantic to when I lived in Sweden and all the way back. They've survived all that. 77% um, Cabernet Sauvignon, 23% Merlot. So you've got the structure and the grip of Cabernet. You've got that soft, plush Merlot component that comes in that kind of softens it, gives it a little bit more roundness. Um, another thing I love about this wine is it's $35 at the winery, and we're selling it for $19.99, which probably accounts nice. for why to date we've sold about 4,000 bottles of this thing. So $19.99, wow. Napa Valley pedigree, um, and the wine's just flat out delicious. Um, solid 90 point scores right across the board for it, which I think are in line with the 90 point wine. Nice. Oh. I mean, we don't we don't we don't see that 1999 value in in good Napa Cap much anymore. So, so rare, so rare. So that's my kickoff. That's where we'll start. Everything else I'll do will be a little bit more of a historical perspective in Napa Valley. There'll be known brands. I'm going to keep it. I'll keep it on my things under fifty dollars for today. So okay. What do you I've got a, I've, I've got a, I've got a, I've got a couple that break that that mark, but we're not doing anything too uh, too ludicrously expensive. Uh, I'm also going to start off with uh, a little a little Napa wine, um, and a, a fairly a fairly new Napa wine. Um, this is the Venn label from the folks at Young Inglewood. So Young Inglewood is a fantastic family owned vineyard and winery and they're in a great neighborhood. They are right next door to Spotswood on the, on the bench there in uh, St. Helena. So right behind the town itself of St. Helena, small family property, 14 acres. Um, they've been making wine since 2007 and it's a mother and son team that make the wines. So their, their first tier of wines under the Young Inglewood name, you will see this, uh, this little tightrope walker guy on the, on the premier labels under that. The Venn series here with this kind of fairly psychedelic uh, stands out on the shelf label is kind of a more uh, contemporary, um, you know, trying a few new things in the cellar, just experimenting. So we've got fruit from this really classic organically farmed, um, biodyna semi-biodynamically farmed vineyard in the heart of Napa. But what they're doing here is experimenting with techniques that perhaps you don't see so much in, in Napa these days. For example, this wine fermented entirely in stainless, long time on the skins, but then aged completely in neutral barrel. So Napa cab with no new wood whatsoever. Um, it's unfined, unfiltered, and only very low SO2 add. So we've got, it's 14% alcohol, um, but really what you're getting is just this incredible, just purity of Napa fruit with no oak influence at all uh, to, the, to the flavor. Maybe some softening of the tannins, uh, but doesn't affect the flavor profile. So it's really nice to be able to see this this fresh, vibrant, fruit forward kind of juicy Napa cab uh, comes in at thirty bucks as well. So pretty rocking price point for you know the pedigree of the fruit and the quality of the of the wine. Uh, and this is one which I just tasted uh, maybe two months back now and I just thought wow this is a really cool modern take on on Napa Cap just really focusing on that purity of fruit and freshness and vitality mm. tastes like Napa Cab, but you don't have that big charry oaky side of things um, tannins are a little softer acidity is very fresh and lifted uh, it's just like super refreshing versus all Napa Cab. So that's how I'm going to kick it off. Then from Young Inglewood. Well, I, I love your kickoff because not only did you educate the listeners and viewers, you educated me because I don't even know that wine. So that's. Oh, yeah. Point. I should say one caveat it is not straight Cabernet, it is Cab, Malot, Cab Franc, and a tiny bit of Malbec. So we're going to proprietary red. So not straight Cab. And I think we were allowed to do that today, right? Delicious, nonetheless. The, the proprietary red uh, is, is king in, in Napa these days, you know. Yeah. Because if we can't do proprietary reds, then I can't drink this wine, and I really want to. Okay, go for it. What have you got next? All right. So from uh, our old friend, Dr. Jerry Seps, I'm going to do some Storybook Mountain. Uh, this is the 2000 and, I think 16? No, 2018 four red. So 
Uh, for anybody who knows Storybrook Mountain Vineyards, they're way high up on the northern end of the Mayacamas range. They are, um, it, it's an old, old property. They were actually founded by the Grimm brothers, if you think back to the German uh, stories from, from Bavaria. So this was actually them founded in the, when was that, back in the, well, way back when. But Jerry took it over in the early, in the early 70s. He's a doctor of, a doctor of history. And uh, he had Andre Chelischeff consult on the property, uh, who told him this could be some of the best Zinfandel vineyard land around. So he did plant almost the entire property exclusively to Zinfandel. And that's really what they've been known for. Um, but, you know, Zinfandel is not the most in vogue, even though it's a wonderful little wine. Uh, but eventually, uh, he wound up planting some Cabernet vines where he does a Cabernet and he does this, which is about $70. And then this uh, Bordeaux style blend. So it's, it's Cab, Petit Verdot, Merlot, and Cab, Cab Franc, only 64% Cab Sauve. It's aged in about not even quite half new oak. So again, to, you, to the wine you were just showing, um, let's taste the fruit. Let the fruit come forward. The oak acts as a nice sort of intermediary where it allows a little bit of oxidation. So the wine kind of mellows out, smooths out, picks up a little bit of complexity. But, you know, you're not drinking splinters, which I find a lot less interesting. I, I like your, your, your presentation on the Ben wine because that whole notion of like the purity of the fruit, we should know what that tastes like. And that's really why we're doing this. But Cabernet does hold the oak fairly well. So, so that's why we're seeing this. 100% um, or farmed, 100% certified organic. There's a, just a great bouquet on this thing. And because you got the four different varietals, I think you get a greater range of aromatics. I think there's a greater range of flavor profile here. However, it's not firmly tannic, so there's like an easy approachability to it. We sell this for $35. It's $45 out of the winery. Uh, and again, for, this is a winery, I think, that just kind of has been under the radar for, for so darn long. Um, Wine Spirits Magazine named it one of the top 15, uh, I'm sorry, top 100 wineries of the world, 15 years running. So people do know about this. Uh, they've gotten a lot of acclaim in the wine press on and on and on. Uh, what else here is important? Well, oh, I know what else is important. During the, uh, when they were handing out the Nobel, when they're handing out the, the Nobel prizes in 1994, this is the wine that was served at the event. I thought that was a nice little history <laughs> factoid I did not know. And it's also been served three times in the White House. So congratulations to Dr. Jerry Seps on top of the Mayakamas range above Calistoga for making a beautiful Four Reds Cabernet blend out of Napa Valley. Yeah, I, d I just had an appointment uh, just a couple of weeks ago uh, with Jerry and uh, it, was all it was awesome as always. His wines are so good across the board. Uh, the, the Zinfandels have long been big staff favorites here uh, at K&L. Uh, I don't remember working with the Four Reds as much, but uh, I did taste that as well. And yeah, it's a stunning little wine. So yeah, I'm nice, nice about the visit. I've never been up there. And I was, as I was working on this this morning, I'm like, what I wouldn't give to, that would be like a top five visit for me. Cool. All right. Next time you're up here, let's go do it. Right on. Some fire, some fire damage in that neighborhood, unfortunately. He keeps on getting pretty close to, to the fires. But uh, anyways, um, onwards um, to the next one. So the next one for me, no, no, no visit to California Cabernet would be complete without something from the Santa Cruz Mountains. So I picked this guy uh, from Assiduous. And Kai came with, uh, came with me on a recent visit around the Santa Cruz Mountains, and we went and visited with winemaker Keegan Mayo from Assiduous, and this is his Bates Ranch Cab. So if anyone knows anything about Santa Cruz Mountains Cabernet, they've likely heard of Bates Ranch before. Um, really highly respected historic site at the very southern end of the Santa Cruz Mountains, uh, right where Hacker Pass runs from the coast over through to Gilroy. Um, this vineyard kind of sits right down there towards the base of Mount Madonna. Um, fantastic vineyard with a storied past of producing very, very age-worthy Cabernet. Um, and this is Keegan's take on it. So this is 2019 vintage from Bates Ranch. This is a combination of some of the old vines at Bates Ranch. This stuff here goes back to the early 70s planted, uh, along with some newer plantings uh, from 2014 plantings. So we've got like 40-year-old vines and just 
vines that were on their fifth leaf. So very interesting combination. Talking to Keegan, he says about how the old vine cab gives it this big density and, and power and lots of those kind of savory aspects. Uh, the young vine fruit giving kind of more upfront perfume and lift. Um, so he actually really likes the combination of the two. You know, a lot of folks are kind of scrapping over trying to get access to the old vine fruit. He actually really likes the combination of the two in the finished wine kind of gives it that multi-dimensional aspect. Um, this comes in at 13.4% alcohol. So pretty respectable for modern day California Cabernet. And it just has this wonderful Cabernet nose. I mean, here's going back to these stereotypes we talk about when Cabernet gets ripened too far, over oaked, you know, acidulated, all these different manipulations that can happen to it, it loses its Cabernet-ness. You know, so I, I really like to celebrate these wines that have that little bit of leafiness, that little kind of dry tobacco note, that cedary element. Um, and this has it in spades. So no, no lack of Cabernet here. Um, it also has that kind of slightly kind of, uh, kind of foresty kind of element that you get from a lot of Santa Cruz Mountains wines. Mm. Just sees 20% wood for 18 months, 20% new wood for 18 months. It has this beautiful little grippy tannins, which again are so varietally correct. You know, Cabernet should, Cabernet Sauvignon should have some tannin. You know, that's, uh, <laughs> that's the varietal. And we don't need to get rid of that. So I love that this embraces that. Fantastic uh, with a nice piece of protein. Uh, and this is a this is a rock in value. Again, we actually sell this a little cheaper than they do at the winery. We sell this for $30, which is, pretty excellent for old vine pedigree Santa Cruz mountain cab made in very, very small amounts. Um, awesome wine. So that's assiduous 2019 Bates ranch cab, totally delicious. And no doubt has a long life ahead of it. I've had wines off of this vineyard with, you know, 20 plus years in the bottle and they hang in there really good. And I have, I have no doubt this one will too. Kai, you tasted this one. What did you think? Yeah, actually, I wanted to make sure we kept focus on Keegan just a little bit because that visit was really one of the more memorable that I've been on. I've seen a lot of yeah. things before. Um, I remember we were pulling out of the Trump Gulch Vineyard ready to head up to the mountains and the direction said, you know, make a left here. And there was that sign that greeted us and said, mm. dangerous road, tread at your own risk, uh, death is imminent. And, and we're like, are we, are we sure this is the right way to go? <laughs> Yeah, then it like turned to turned to pretty rough and rutted kind of gravel, and uh, we were in the real in the real backwoods there. Um, but thankfully, thankfully Keegan came down from the vineyard to the to the main road, <laughs> you know the the one the one lane gravel road to meet us on a, on a dirt bike and led us up to the uh, to the vineyard. So, now nah, super nice guy making some great wines, and yeah. Uh, Bates Ranch is just a, a fantastic example of those little Cabernet gems that are hiding in, in California's kind of coastal ranges. You know, we look at a lot of the valleys, you know, Sonoma Valley, Napa Valley for, for these big blockbuster cabs. But actually, there are some some beautiful little vineyards tucked away in the more coastal parts of California that tend to produce that more restrained, lower alcohol style of cab, which we're kind of focusing on today. So, uh, Kai, over to you for your next wine. Yeah, just one last note. I just recall thinking about Keegan when he toured us through the vineyard was his kind of like the story behind his relationship with the neighbors, um, the wild animals that live up there, the owners, everything was just like, if you really wanted to make money making wine, this is just a terrible idea and a terrible place to be. <laughs> but you know, the guy's passion was, no, this is a really good site. It's hard to farm, but if you farm it right. Uh, and of course, we were greeted by the most insane view because you had that sort of bowl of trees that opened up and we were just looking over the uh the monterey bay and i thought drinking this pinot gris that morning was just absolutely just you know shockingly shocking to the palate just wakes you right up and you're like wow this is why i do this for a living yeah man that that wine is very very vibrant yeah we have a few different wines from keegan assiduous we have his gris skin contact gris his chardonnay uh this cab and some and some malbec santa cruz mountain malbec don't get to say that every day but it's really good so i'm glad i'm glad you could join us on that visit that was a fun day and thanks to that visit we, some of those wines are now in la as well so if anyone from the south wants to stop in and get them better beat a awesome. path there's not a lot of these wines around awesome
Yeah, you know, I was thinking what we could do next time, <clears throat> advertise in advance that we're doing this and people could do like the play along and taste, taste along at home version. Sure. You know, buy the kit, maybe have a slightly better price for the whole kit and they can taste what you and I taste. Uh, then, I would, then, then I would have to actually decide on a lineup uh, in advance and stick to it. I... <laughs> More than 20 minutes ago. <laughs> All right, over to you. Uh, so you mentioned fires before. So fires are a common thread to everything. Of course, fires are ravaging the West Coast from Temecula all the way up to Washington State, all the way up to Canada, of course. And so that's been a real tragic disaster. Um, the next one on my list was uh, severely impacted by it, but we're not going to lose the property. But some of you who are familiar with a little bit old school Napa Valley Cabernets might recall the Burgess label. Um, so Tom Burgess founded this back in 72. But this too is a property that goes all the way back to like the late 1800s, um, was originally planted. Now this is, the, this is on Howell Mountain, but not quite Howell Mountain ABA. But this was planted by Swiss Italian immigrants back in the 1880s. Uh, it was Chateau Souverain for a period of time, where both Ward Winiarski of Stag's Leap Wine Cellars, as well as Mike Gergich of Gergich Cellars had come through there. So they kind of cut their teeth on this property. So when Tom picked it up, um, got a little bit more focused and uh, has been making sort of kind of, you know, rough and tumble mountain cabernets, which maybe that's not always the style for the broad market, but they're very, uh, they're very expressive. They're very unique wines. This is, um, this is all like volcanic, uh, volcanic soils with like large granitic boulders in it. So if, you know, again, if you're into suffering and this is the kind of farming you want to do, this is the kind of wine you get. And, uh, this is now, no, so Tom sold it in 20, 2020. Uh, he sold it to the Lords family, which is, of course, the new owners of um, Height Cellars. So it's still a family-held property. Um, but the tragedy among, about this is, though, that three weeks after they inked the paper to, to buy it, the glass fire came through and uh, destroyed the winery, a lot of the wines. Uh, so this is actually, this, this is a 2015 release. So it's six years old, people. And we're selling this for forty nine ninety nine. That's a smoking good wine. I I first tried it when the um, the Heights rep came over to the house here to taste us on some new releases from Heights, including the Brendels, which we talked about last week. And uh, but this is the wine I wound up drinking for dinner that night. And I had it in a decanter for about an hour or two. Uh, it's stainless steel tank fermented, and then it's aged in fifty percent new French oak, so fifty percent neutral, obviously. I'm sorry, 15% new French oak and the rest 85% is neutral. Um, Burgess has been just one of the unsung heroes for a long time up there. And it was kind of fun in a way, long before I was in the wine business, I bought this book, which is like the Wine Spectators, California's Great Cabernets, uh, released in 1992. And so it's fun to go back to this as a reference to get a little bit more information on Burgess and what's going on here. So. Um, I know, Brian, you've worked quite a bit with uh, the last few runs of the, the Luna wines. Mm -hmm. uh, and that winery, of course, being over in Silverado Trail. So the, the Lawrence family has purchased that winery and will make this the new home of Burgess. So the vineyards are still intact. I don't know how much of the wine is still intact. But while the 15 exists and there's not much of it, you'd be making a massive mistake not, not grabbing this. Uh, you know, drink it tonight, put it in the cellar. Yeah, 50 bucks here. I think it's $70 at the winery. So I hope they're not watching or listening to us because they probably wouldn't like that. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I don't know what the exact truth of this story was, but I was, I was told this when tasting this wine with, uh, with the folks um, was that Burgess just misses the, the Howe Mountain AVA. And I guess, I guess historically they were like asked if they wanted to be involved in the like Howl Mountain Association when they were forming the AVA and they were like, nah, you know, not, not, not interested. So they kind of drew the boundary line, like just above, their, <laughs> just above their properties. So, you know, you're, you're essentially getting Howl Mountain Cabernet, you know, for, for just general Napa Valley prices. But when I tasted the wine, I think it, it shows a lot of those same very powerful, concentrated, structured kind of graphite tones that you get from a lot of Howl Mountain Cab. Um, really good wine. It was just a couple of weeks ago I tasted this and I was also really impressed with it. So nice pick. Yeah, that's, that's the exact same story I've heard. So I'm pretty sure that's true. And I also remember from when I was with my previous employer in the wine business, 
um, the owner of that store set some sort of record at Premier Napa Valley a long time ago when he paid the single highest uh, amount ever paid for a Premier Napa Valley lot. And it was, I think, like a mid 80s vintage barrel of uh, Burgess Cabernet, but he kind of just flipped for it and way overspent and probably a terrible business decision. But it showed you for a guy who really, you know, built, helped build the Southern California Napa Valley cab business, he was just gaga over this thing and just had to have it. So, um, yeah, they've made some dynamite wines over the years. Um, okay, onwards. Um, I, I guess actually this is kind of a kind of a nice uh, segue into my into my next wine here, which is also a little bit of a hidden gem, I would say, in in Napa, which would be these guys, mm. White Rock. Yeah. So White Rock, one of my favorite kind of, as you say, sleeper, sleeper finds in, in Napa Valley. I'm sure they were probably not one of the sleeper finds, but they don't seem to have rocketed to, uh, to huge acclaim, or I think they should if, if you're just judging by the wine in the glass. But it's really, really cool property. I, again, I've been lucky enough to visit it. Um, very historic property, originally founded in 1870, and they still have this beautiful stone, uh, what was the original winery building that's now a residence, um, stone building from that era. Um, now the winery is uh, dug into the hillside and some amazing caves that go back under the ground uh, in the hillside. Um, bought uh, back in the 1970s uh, by the Von der Riesch family who came over from, from Europe looking for a, a dream dream property to uh, make world-class Cabernet. And this is where they chose. So as I say, it had been almost continuously planted uh, since the 1870s. They took over in the 70s, have farmed it organically ever since. Um, it's a little tiny kind of valley of its own that sits in like this little bowl um, just south of Stag's Leap itself. So it's, uh, it's Napa Valley AVA, but it's just south of Stag's Leap. And it's right on the bottom of that kind of soda, soda rock canyon that goes up there on, on the east side of the valley. What I think is very interesting about the property is white rock by name and white rock by nature. This whole property is on this uh, very uh, white to light yellow volcanic uh, tooth. So this uh, kind of compressed volcanic ash. Uh, kind of looks a bit like chalk, but actually it's it's uh, it's volcanic ash. So very uh, pronounced flavor profile in the wines, uh, very perfumed. Uh, it's it's kind of a mid temperature site, I would say, as far as Napa Valley. You know that side of the valley tends to get a little bit more of that afternoon heat, but this is fairly far, you know, south down the valley. Uh, so the wines, even though this is fourteen seven alcohol, uh, it still retains this very lifted perfume real vibrant perfume and they're not afraid of a bit of structure in their wines so you know all of the white rock wines i've had age really well this is 2016 vintage which is current release that we have it's 60 bucks um and yeah it's just really classic old school napa cab um has a little kind of minty hint on the nose real kind of crushed cassis characters has some grippy tannins just Really, really classic wine. If you haven't tried this, it's kind of funny. I recommend this wine to people all the time. And the most common response is, oh, I've, I've heard of the wines, but I don't really know anything about them, you know? So I, I, I try and get people to, to grab a bottle and check them out. And I'm yet to have someone come back and give me anything but stellar feedback on, on the wine. So definitely one to check out, White Rock Cab. You, you bring up so many points as we're talking here that are so valid. I just, I should be sitting here jotting notes to keep it going. One of the things, a thread that's both in our previous talk and this talk is of course about alcohol and with Chardonnay and with, with Cabernet, even though these are, I think all of our wines are coming in sub 15% and probably as low as 13 and a half. But I think those are pretty appropriate numbers for Cabernet because you know, these big, bold, powerful wines, they carry the alcohol very well. It's, I think it's when you're north of 15, you're getting into, sometimes it can taste hot or be problematic or you're having an issue the next day. Totally. And like, you know, I think there's also a tendency of folks to, to deliberately misstate their alcohol. So I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't mind betting this is a very, uh, very honest 14.7, whereas uh, some of the 14.9s you see out there are probably significantly more than that. Um, but yeah, I mean, just... 
uh, I don't know really what else to say about it. Um, if you get to go to the property, appointment only, but you will get to walk and tour inside the caves under the hillside. It's a really spectacular experience. You get to taste underground in these big volcanic volcanic caves. Um, another property sadly ravaged by fire uh, in 2017. The old stone winery building burned, but the, the stone skeleton of the building uh, was, was being restored when I was there. And the whole hillside where the winery was, was torched. But the winery, of course, was all tucked away underground in the caves. So um, a lot of it was a lot of it was OK. All the equipment on the crush pad was destroyed, unfortunately. But that's what we're dealing with in wine country these days, it seems. Um, but nonetheless, super cool wine, uh, a go to for me when I'm when I'm recommending Napa Cabernet to folks, which sometimes shocks people. But as I say, when they take the wine home and they drink the wine, I always get really, really great feedback on it. So please check them out. Yeah, I've, I've had issues with selling that wine too, for the, and the exact same thing where people are like, oh yeah, I do know, I've seen that label and I've been told a hundred times I should try it. And then they just keep walking. <laughs> like, well, if you've been told by a hundred different wine people that you should try it, I think you should try it. <laughs> you really, you really well, should. Yeah, it's 60 bucks. I can sell you one that's 160 that's not nearly as good if you like, but please just take my word for it. This one's delicious. Yeah, and no, the good news there is like mag wines that are not on the front covers of magazines and wines that aren't getting the ridiculous off the scale scores usually are holding their prices a lot better. So you're, you're getting a lot more interesting, better quality wine for a better price. True story. Over to you, sir. So... Yeah, the fire vein continues. If you've read the San Francisco Chronicle recently, you would have seen um, uh, Stu Madrone of Smith Madrone. Let me show you the label. This is another property. It's been around a little bit. We'll tell you about that in a moment. Love but that. He, he was interviewed with regards to fire insurance policies in Napa Valley and how growers are now seeing, wineries are now seeing increases in like one to 300% for their insurance premiums. So a lot of them are simply just dropping it. Um, Stu said basically what he's doing is he's installing all kinds of, uh, you know, water spraying devices around the property. He's um, you know, clearing all the brush around, doing whatever he can, because he's basically, if the fire hits us, we're done, we're out of business and it's over. They, you know, talk about as if farming isn't hard enough, you know, now you throw yeah. in infernos. So kind of crazy, but okay. The good news is, so a neat thing here about Smith Madrone, and I've been kind of selling these wines as long as I've been in the business, but they are this year celebrating their 50th anniversary. Um, they bought the property back in 1971, but again, a property that's been up there a very long time. We're on the top of Spring Mountain, so it's very cool up there. You're looking at 1,300 to 2,000 feet of elevation. Um, the net result is, and, and what I think it's fun, what, what you and I are getting to see, but I would love for the, uh, the viewers at home to try, is how distinctively different each one of these wines is, and predominantly as a fact, a function of where's the fruit grown. So this is cool climate Cabernet on account of its elevation, and it's immediately abundant, avail, um, <clears throat> apparent in the nose because you get a, a little bit more of the kind of sort of the green pyrazine start to come through that I don't always associate with Cabernet Sauvignon. And you wonder, is there some Merlot? Is there some Cap Franc in there? There is not. This is Cabernet Sauvignon through and through. But yet you get that kind of almost like uh, Grave, Pesac, Lyonien kind of aromatics, which I think is a really refreshing component. And because it's a mountain Cabernet, you get those tannins, but they're harvested perfectly right. So they're spot on. And as the current release, it's 2016 vintage. I, I do like wineries that uh, make the hard decision to sit on wines, a little barrel age, a little bottle age before they release it. So when, by the time you get it, it's a lot easier to drink. Um, what else is interesting about them? Oh, well, one other thing that they're famous for, but it's not a part of today's show, is they make some of California's best Riesling. And so if you're in the store and you're kind of curious about domestic Riesling, uh, it's the only domestic Riesling that was included in Stuart Pickett's book about the great Rieslings of the world, which virtually ignored anything being done in the, in the new world, except for Smith Madrone. So great Riesling, also really good Chardonnay. But the Cabernet has a very kind of a, a lifted high tone aspect to it. Good mountain fruit, 
grippy tannins that are prevalent, but you know, go down smooth. They just act as a nice component. And, and I love that kind of hint of herbaceousness uh, on the nose, which makes this indicative of like it's Spring Mountain, it's high elevation. Yeah, Spring Mountain, I think one of the one of the sub regions of Napa that has them one of the most distinctive qualities. You, you know, you hope you could pick it in a in a blind tasting. Always seem to have that slightly more herbaceous quality. Whether it's whether it's the afternoon shade, you know, being being on that you know east facing side of the range, or whether it's the cool airflow coming over the top. But yeah, very distinctive. And again, I mentioned earlier on not losing the cabernetness. Um, that's a spot that really seems to hold on to that beautiful varietal definition. And I'm a huge fan of uh, Smith & Jones as well. That actually would have been on my list uh, if it were not on yours before I uh, settled in to pick some wine. So that was, a, that was a double pick right there. Both of us were going for that one. Yeah, I had to rush and, it in there because I had a feeling you might pick it. And awesome value too, right? You want to tell folks what a great deal that bottle is? $49.95. Now, of course, 50 bucks sounds like a lot of money, and it is, but when we're talking world-class Napa Valley Cabernet, it's, it's really, it's chump change, and it's the kind of wine you should drink with a nice dinner. You can put it in your cellar, but it's totally approachable. But, you know, if you're going to make a, a proper dinner with some properly nice stemware, you know, this, this is exactly <laughs> where you want to be to give credit to the quality of food, have that quality of wine. Um, one thing I think we should kind of, because we're, we're starting to run out of wines here, I'd like to get back and talking about a little bit more in terms of where Cabernet is this day and age. Um, when the 18 vintage was released coming to market and you wrote up the, uh, the bulk of the newsletter about that. And I remember one of the things you pointed out was that with the 18s, even if it was a slightly coolish vintage, we really saw the hand of the winemaker pulling back to make wines that were sort of fresher, brighter, and a bit more, uh, accessible. And I was kind of wondering if you could share a few more thoughts on the, the changing sort of style of Cabernet we're seeing specifically from Napa. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I think, you know, I think a lot of people have been talking about pulling stuff back and making more elegant wines for a really long time. Uh, but we kind of had a string of pretty warm drought vintages, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but for me, like 2018, the very cool end to the growing season in 2018, just like that was the perfect hand for winemakers that wanted to make wines that were a little more elegant, hold that little little brighter acid line. Um, and I just, you know, when I started tasting the 18s, uh, I honestly thought to myself, okay, the the trade is going to love these wines, you know, like, you know, we, t we tend to gravitate towards these slightly more restrained, lower alcohol, more structured, age worthy food, food oriented wines. Um, but I was like, are the is the general punter on the street that likes, you know, that likes big, bold, saturated, extracted Napa Cab? Like, are they going to get these wines? Because I, I really thought there was quite a dramatic change in style kind of across the board. I mean, there's a few folks that just stick to what they do and that's what they do. Um, but I mean, in general, I mean, I, you know, tasting the vintage, uh, a cross section of the whole vintage, it's pretty different than anything that's, that's gone before it for quite some time. So, uh, I love the wines, but I mean, people, if people are used to that very plush, uber rich mouthfeel and ripeness, uh, the 2018s are a bit different. I mean, they're plenty ripe, uh, but they're, you know, there's definitely more vibrancy, more structure, more acidity to the wines. So, um, yeah, cool, cool stuff. I actually have a, I have a 2018 to finish with if you, uh, if you're ready. Do it. It's not Napa. Um, <laughs> this is Carmel Valley. Ooh, yeah. So, Ian Brand, champion of Monterey County. Um, this is his uh, Massa Vineyard Cab. Another, another wine that Kai and I tasted on our recent trip down that part of the world. Um, so this is from the Massa Vineyard in Carmel Valley. So you follow Carmel Valley from the ocean, and this is a ways inland. This is, you know, the, the interior part of Carmel Valley and a really historic vineyard, uh, first planted in the late 60s, known as the Derny Vineyard, and really achieved a lot of acclaim uh, in, you know, the, the 70s through to the 80s was really considered one of the one of the premier Cabernet growing vineyards. Uh, actually, the, the first vineyard established in the Carmel Valley uh, AVA as far as a, 
a commercially producing vineyard. Um, this is from a block that was planted 1971. So some, some pretty good, uh, some pretty good vine age here. Um, and Ian was saying how it's kind of old school clones of Cabernet planted in kind of an old school way with spacing and everything else. Uh, and he, he feels that it needs to be made like old school Cabernet. So this is coming in at 13 on the nose, I believe. Yeah. 13% alcohol. Um, and when you get to taste the wine, you will just see this is like, this is like stepping back a couple of decades in, in California Cabernet, S you know, super leafy, very fresh, lifted uh, aromatics, very mid weight on the palate, nothing, nothing big and heavy about this wine, but just, just so pure, so detailed, wonderful texture on the palate. Um, again, Kai, you tasted this one. So have your thoughts on this while I uh, enjoy a taste. Yeah, I thought the thing remarkable about Ian, he's like a truffle dog, the way he can like sniff out the great vineyards of that area. Um, standing there in the winery and, and listening to his whole spiel and like why, why he's in the middle of sort of like where he's just like outside of like Salinas in the middle of sort of nowhere. Um, but he has figured out, like you're talking about Carmel Valley uh, and then over in San Benito County where he's just finding one super cool kind of ignored vineyard after the next he's kind of bringing the notoriety to it. And then he's bringing other people in that he believes are, you know, winemakers of great sort of, uh, have, have a great stylistic touch and they're making these. So collectively they're all making these vineyards, a handful of vineyards up in that area, uh, get known and eventually renowned. So I, I was blown away by what we saw up there and listening to him and, and tasting right across the line that he can make everything yeah. from again, Pinot Gris, the Cabernet Sauvignon and, and Chef de Neuf du Pop style blends that are all distinctive, delicious, and um, insanely well priced, which I love that most of all. Yeah, yeah, this is it's kind of funny because uh, when when we were when we were coming online to do this tasting today, um, I had been looking for notes on this wine, Massa Block 10 2018 vintage. Couldn't find anything on Ian's site, so I, I gave him a call quickly. He called me right back. And uh, and gave me gave me his uh, Cliff's Notes version of it, but it was interesting. I was like, well, why? How come I can't find any notes on it? He made forty eight cases of this oh, vintage. Gosh. Yeah, <laughs> I uh, I think purely because while we were there tasting in the winery, and I was kind of nosing through some of the boxes of wine that were surrounding us, and can we taste this? Can we taste this? Can we taste this? <laughs> After our trip, I wrote to him and said, hey, uh, any chance you'd like to sell us some of this, 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 you know, wines that he would not normally put into distribution. So um, yeah, tiny, tiny little production, uh, just two, two barrels. Um, and we have a few cases of it. And it is just it is so, so good. I, this is the first time tasting it today since you and I were down at the winery a few weeks back and it's just as magic as I remember. And sometimes on those trips, you can get a little carried away, you know, when you're tasting all those wines in the place with the winemaker. But I must admit, this is, this is every bit as special as, uh, as I thought it was that day when we were tasting it. So yeah, beautiful wine. The most expensive wine I pulled, 75 bucks, but micro production super old vines uh you know no expense spared in the in the meticulous production of this wine and it's it's truly magical cabinet really is you remember that time i hosted ian brand on instagram live <laughs> <laughs> yeah, neither and do we, I. <laughs> yeah and we saw this much of ian right yeah unfortunately we had a bit of a technical uh glitch on that one so i wound up talking for 30 minutes on my own which was just a, a real joy <laughs> yeah yeah he's, uh, he's, uh, he's uh, fine, and i got to taste them again and uh you know like you said we tasted them then you do get excited the passion of the moment but uh got back home and the wines are just as just as good if not better as i recall uh, upon our visit so, so yeah yeah you, really. you went five wines i went four wines i don't have another one unless i go rummage through the wine locker here I had, I had, I had four. I think we were just, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. We're all good. <laughs> all right. Well, hopefully we've given you, uh, you folks watching something to think about. Um, you know, please don't believe that all California cab is big, uh, 16%, uh, you know, uh, Oak, Oak filled fruit bombs. Uh, there are tons of really beautiful, well-balanced, elegant, uh, wines out there. Hopefully we've given you a couple to consider today. Uh, if you if you need any more recommendations, 
hit up Kai or myself, uh, we'd be more than happy to put a list together for you of stuff to check out. You can tell us your favorite wine and we can go from there. That's always kind of a jumping off point for me. If you tell me a wine that you love, that immediately kind of gives me something to to hook into and go from there. So yeah, we're just, we're just trying to get the message out there that, you know, there's these wines, many of which maybe you've not heard of before, but super classy wines that are, that are worthy of your time and attention. Kai, anything to say to wrap it up? Yeah, I like that because our mission statement here sort of is to let's, let's bring California wines into people's uh, homes again. So like you pay attention to them as like the first thing you think of. And I love the fact that we have a Brit and a Swede being the advocates for <laughs> West Coast wine, Cali not California wine, but all wines from from the United States. So who knows? Maybe we'll do the the, uh, the Finger Lakes in New York State on uh, on an upcoming show. <laughs> yeah, we'll we're going to figure out what we'll do next time. There was a couple questions I think that went unanswered. Um, I believe our own Kate uh, wrote in there. Uh, Would you decant these young Cabernets? Uh, Personally, today I actually in them because <laughs> I'm gonna I'm gonna take them to the team uh, so everyone can get a chance to to taste them. But yes, uh, I I personally would throw all of these in a decanter. Um, I don't think you have to, but uh, you'll you'll get more expression out of them and probably soften up any any slightly young tannins that there are. The oldest one we tasted I tasted today was a 16. So I mean, any of these can be can be decanted uh, just to open them up. Kai, I imagine you would have similar kind of response. Would you, yeah, do you decant them? And, and actually, what I did was I opened them about. I think I pulled corks about two hours ago to taste them, and then an hour before we went on, I put them in the refrigerator. Uh, even though we're air conditioned here, but still, you know, it's a little bit warm, and I want to have the wine sort of at a cellar temperature, so they're really just a little bit cool on the lips, and I think that makes the wines that much more uh, enjoyable, but not too cold, because then obviously the tannins and the alcohol get a little bit exaggerated. And I and thank yeah, you for we... pointing out, people can ask questions. I see a lot of names <laughs> flipping up down below here. There's a, a few comments about like, you know, I see things like you're the two handsomest guys we've ever seen in the wine business. I know enough, enough, but uh, it's so slow. It's so smart. Someone just wrote, uh, no, 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 oh, that's none nice. of that's happening. <laughs> Um, and then uh, along the way, yeah. And then uh, we'll be we'll be back in uh, with the next category. Uh, Kai and I will put our heads together here, and uh, we'll get another date on the calendar. Kai, always a pleasure. Fun tasting with you. Um, catch up soon. Right. Thanks everyone for tuning in. Cheers, guys. <laughs>